Suddenly, you're alone with yourself, your car, and the Darlington Raceway. Look at that fella drive. I've never seen the like of it. What well, is that time of year again where the heat is hot and the track too tough to tame? Well, it's even hotter. Welcome to our final stretch special where we are getting you ready for the Southern 500 at Darlington Raceway. It's been a special year for NASCAR as they celebrate 75 years of racing and very few tracks can say they've basically been there since the beginning like Darlington. NASCAR ran its first ever race in February of 1948 at Daytona and would evolve into one of the most popular sports in the world with new tracks popping up all across the country. And in 1950, Darlington Raceway would host its first ever Southern 500 and become the sport's first ever super speedway. But the legend of Darlington goes back a little bit further than that. History and tradition. Two words often associated with Darlington Raceway. But before it became the track too tough to tame, it was a field used to harvest cotton and peanuts. The big question you may be asking is, why Darlington? Well, you weren't the only one questioning former stock car driver and Darlington native Harold Brasington, who pitched the idea after attending the Indianapolis 500 in 1933. Legend has it he even sketched out the track on a napkin and started seeking a way to fund his dream. When he first pulled together a group of businessmen here in Darlington, they thought he was crazy. Brasington's grandson, who carries on the family name, says on top of doubts, the Great Depression and World War II would also put his plans to build this track on hold. But in 1948, Brasington would strike the deal he needed over what some say was a game of cards. The man who owned the land, Sherman Ramsey, but one condition, the minnow pond could not be touched. He got enough people together that believed in it and they started construction in 1949 and knocked it out within 10 months. Darlington would host its first ever race Labor Day weekend of 1950. Brasington advertised it as the greatest and fastest racetrack in the world statement many drivers say stands true 73 years later. You have to run right on the limit of being out of control. The track is so technically challenging um, because of the way the track is shaped. It's two totally different corners and in each side of the racetrack it's very narrow and you run really close to the wall. Remember that fishing pond? Well, since Brasington's handshake deal meant the pond had to be left untouched, his prestigious design of an oval-shaped track was scrapped. The iconic Darlington egg shape would go on to test even the top drivers for over 70 years. The first Southern 500 would draw over 25,000 fans to watch the first ever 500-mile race in NASCAR history. It was you know 95 degrees and and cars were blowing up left and right and and it was just a, a matter of survival. While most historical NASCAR tracks have fallen by the wayside or even taken off the Cup Series schedule, Darlington Raceway has stood the test of time for over seven decades. But why? We're standing in a world-class facility now and. People used to complain that Darlington was pretty shabby and, and bare bones, and you talk to a guy like Jeff Burton, and he says, that's how racetracks should be. It's a racetrack. It's, it's not a trip to Vegas. It's such a difficult track, and it's so unique to any other place we go. You kind of got to forget about the competition and just think about competing with the track. And if you beat the track, then you can beat everybody else. These days, NASCAR is making pit stops in big name cities like Phoenix, Daytona, and Chicago. Yet every fall, racers still make the trip to Darlington, South Carolina, making it a bucket list track of places to watch a race. We might not be the fanciest place, uh, but I think we're on the, on the cool chart. We're right at the top. And so to be able to continue that tradition that started here back in 1950, continue to build on that tradition uh, is exciting. Kerry Tharp has served as the president of Darlington Raceway since 2016 and will be retiring following the 73rd Southern 500. Palm Charter Principal Avery Moore says Tharp's ability to build off that tradition has helped more fans get into racing 
including his students, at the only motorsports high school in the country. It has been a blessing for our students to still have a little bit of a window into that, that world, the top of that world. Our students have had the chance to see that. And so, of course, that's the inspiring. Moore says a lot of local tracks have fallen by the wayside in recent years, like Myrtle Beach Speedway in 2020. He says tracks like Darlington make stock car racing a sport multiple generations of fans can appreciate and enjoy. The South is where it started. Darlington is still connected to the guys that started NASCAR. And so when the drivers, they're all over doing all the road courses and everything else, but when they come here, it's almost like they go back in time. And I think that that, that nostalgia is connecting uh, the drivers and the teams to something of what it was back in the day. And that, nev that will never go away. For over seven decades, the track Too Tough to Tame has been unforgiving, even to the best behind the wheel tearing up tires to etching that iconic stripe along each car's right side panel. Brazington believes his grandfather would be proud to know his dream to build a racetrack in Darlington has become a 500 mile nightmare to even some of the best drivers in the world 73 years later. I think that really illustrates the importance of the driver's skill. In, in mastering this track. And some drivers say you, you really don't master the track, you just have to uh, do the best you can because of the way it's set up with this X-shaped uh, you know, layout. It's got different turns and that's, that's very challenging. So they have grown up listening to people like Kale Yarborough, one of our local heroes, talk about the toughness of the track. And people like Dale Earnhardt Sr who had, you know, I think 10 wins at this track. And they figure if, if those guys respect this track and feel like that that's the ultimate challenge, then we should pay attention to that. There's the checkered flag for Cale Yarborough. Cale Yarborough's made a boyhood dream come true. Cale said, it was the hardest day I ever had, the hardest race I ever ran. When Harold Brazington pitched the idea of building a super speedway in the small town of Darlington, most thought he was crazy. Yet here we are once again getting ready for another Southern 500 at the very track he built 73 years ago. Brazington is no longer with us, but his family still lives in Darlington and is making sure his legacy is not forgotten. Your grandfather is the reason we're here. He built Darlington uh, almost 75 years ago. Well, I had a great time like all the kids that grew up in Darlington going to the parades and coming here to see my uh, heroes in the racing world and I just took it for granted that you know this track had always been here and always would be here. I'd heard the rumors and legends about how the track came to be but I didn't really give it much thought as a kid growing up you tend to take these things for granted. Once you finally found out the story, the history, all the legend of Darlington seems to be true. What went through your mind to see what he had to do to have a dream fulfilled? Well, I had the good fortune of talking with some of his friends that were still alive and remembered the stories and were here to see some of the events. So I got first-hand accounts of the meetings that happened when he first pulled together a group of businessmen here in Darlington and said, we're going to build a a mile and a quarter racetrack that's a paved asphalt racetrack for stock cars and they thought he was crazy. So he got enough people together that believed in it and they started construction in 1949 and knocked it out within 10 months. It was an amazing feat. Darlington, 73 years. What is it about this track that you think has allowed it? to survive. I think after a, a rapid expansion in NASCAR in the 1990s and 2000s that that expansion wasn't sustained and eventually people came to understand the value of legacy tracks. We're standing in a world-class facility now and people used to complain that Darlington was pretty shabby and, and bare bones and you talk to a guy like Jeff Burton and he says, that's how racetracks should be. It's a racetrack, it's, it's not a trip to Vegas. I, I think that that 
connection to the history and knowing that men like Junior Johnson ran his first NASCAR uh, Cup race on this track, um, you know, that, that, that makes this place special. Winning at Darlington is special. How, how does that feel for your family, knowing that what your grandfather built is still beloved by those who love what he loved, and that was stock car racing? I think because it was designed in a time when cars didn't go as fast as they do now. So from what I've heard the drivers share is that it's got a narrow line and turns one and two are so different from turns two and three that it is a really counterintuitive kind of feeling that you get to find the fastest line around this track. One of uh, the coolest things I ever heard was an interview with Bud Moore talking about coaching Dale Earnhardt Sr. on the fastest line around this track and getting up on that rail was how they did it in the old days because it was a guardrail, a metal rail on wooden posts and you had guys like Junior Johnson that would take a leaf spring out of a truck and stick it in his quarter panel and he'd get on that rail and you know this is the guy that invented drafting. So you had guys like Dale Earnhardt Sr. and Junior Johnson getting out here and still getting their butts whipped by the quirkiness of this track just because of the narrow line and the different turns. And so, you know, some people hate it, but most people love it. Why do you think this track is so tough to tame even for some of the top drivers? I think that really illustrates the importance of the driver's skill. In, in mastering this track and some drivers say you, you really don't master the track you just have to uh, do the best you can because of the way it's set up with its X shape. So they have grown up listening to people like Kale Yarborough, one of our local heroes, talk about the toughness of the track and people like Dale Earnhardt Sr. who had you know I think 10 wins at this track and they figure if, if those guys respect this track and feel like that that's the ultimate challenge, then we should pay attention to that. Of the tracks that he was responsible for, do you think Darlington was his favorite? Of course, Darlington was his first love. Yeah, that was, that was always his favorite. And you know, he left the track in 1953, and I think that the circumstances were always uh, an issue of regret for him because it wasn't by choice but that's how business goes sometimes and he went on to build other tracks in other places. But you know, I was a lucky kid because I got to spend a lot of time with my grandfather. Uh, unfortunately, like that generation, he was a man of few words. He wasn't interested in talking about the history in the past. He always had an idea for the future, so he spent more time talking to me about the next track he was gonna build in his future plans. But when Jim Hunter came along, uh, he reached out to Granddad and reestablished a relationship. He understood the importance of that legacy and what it contributed to the sport of NASCAR. And Granddad, in his later years, would come out here and visit with Mr. Hunter and drive around the track and really look at how that track had evolved through the years. And he appreciated that the shape of the track had stayed the same while the grandstands got upgraded and they, they named a the grandstand for him. So he was thrilled in his later years to uh, get some recognition and appreciation for that. And we're just proud as his family that he contributed this to the sport and it endures today. Do you feel if your grandfather were to come out here today, he would be proud of what he accomplished? We're just huge race fans. So when the race is in town, we're, we're the biggest fans out here rooting for the drivers and for NASCAR. I know that Granddaddy would be very proud and gratified to, to know that drivers still consider this, you know, the crown jewel, that if they can win at Darlington, that that's the pinnacle of their career. And he, he would appreciate the enduring legacy that, that Darlington has in the sport. In 2016, the NASCAR Hall of Fame honored Brazington with the Landmark Award, recognizing him for an outstanding contribution to the sport of stock car racing. Although the Brazingtons have had no official ownership or even affiliation with Darlington Raceway since 1953, they still attend all the races when NASCAR comes to town.
If you've ever been to the Southern 500, you're bound to hear at least two things. The engines roaring around the track too tough to tame, and for the last 29 years, the voice of Dan Lockamy, who is known now as the voice of Darlington Raceway. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Cookout Southern 500 at the Lady in Black. Yes, she is too tough to tame, and this is one of the best places to experience a race, and we're so glad to have you here at Darlington Raceway. This is going to be something you are going to talk about and remember for the rest of your life. I grew up in Dillon, uh, just about 30 minutes away from Darlington Raceway, and uh, came to my first race here at the track Too Tough to Tame in 1965 as a kid in the Boy Scouts. And that was a cool thing about being a part of the Boy Scouts because you knew you were gonna get to go to the races here at Darlington and being a fan and loved everything about racing, uh, that was the coolest thing. You know, as a kid, I mean, you're just thrilled to be here. There was just something about the entire pageantry of this, uh, the colorful cars, uh, the loud motors, uh, the enormous amount of crowds then, you know, on both sides. And uh, it was just like, it was really, if you're a race fan in that regard, I mean, you felt like you, you just walked into heaven. It's big trouble now. I just loved racing, loved to come over here, and I realized, wait a minute, I'm in broadcasting. You know, I could be part of the media, because a lot of my friends were doing that. Fast forward to 1994, I get a phone call from Russell Branham, said, uh, I, need, uh, I need some help, and I need a favor. So I met with him and he said, I need you to go up and help my guy in the tower, you know, during race weekend, uh, to help him out doing the PH announcing stuff. And I said, sure, I'll be glad to. And lo and behold, I thought it was gonna be like a one-off. And the next thing you know, 29 years later, I'm still here, isn't that amazing? I've always felt like what's kind of helped me here at Darlington is the fact that I'm a fan first and I approach my announcing duties as a fan first and I'm like I got the coolest seat in the house and you know I know my what my duties are but at the same time you know I'm still a fan and I like to convey all the excitement all the pageantry Everything that we're experiencing here at Darlington Raceway, I like to, to uh, convey that message as a fan so the fans will say, yeah, I know what he's talking about. I got the same feeling. And that's the cool thing about doing what I do, as, as, as I said, with the best seat in the house, which is it on top of the tower, and having a chance to not only introduce the drivers, introduce our dignitaries a lot of times, and being in victory lane. So, I mean, there's so many elements to this that even today, after all these years of being a fan and being part of Darlington Raceway, I mean, that excitement has not, whatever, it has not filtered down at all. It is still as high as it, as it ever was. Over the many, many years, there's so many memories, but you know, when Ricky Craven and Kurt Busch raced to that very, very close finish of inches, that became the closest finish in NASCAR. Here I mean, we barely could contain ourselves up there. We were like bouncing around, wondering what's gonna happen. And, and all I remember was saying that if they'd have crashed, Dave Blaney would have won this race. You know, I've had some of the best people in the world to work with in the tower. Uh, recently, of course, right now is Tim Califorma. He is a great, great guy. He is a true announcer too. I've worked with Bill Hennessy, Hill Overton, who was a great historian. I learned so much from Hill. I learned so much from Bill. I learned so much from everybody that's ever been in that track. And you take a little bit from everybody. You know, I always say that uh, in, in the world of broadcasting, uh, in my years of being in radio, and the same thing with being here, I'll keep doing this as long as I'm relevant. So, and I'll keep doing it this as long as they'll ask me. And I'll keep bringing the energy. I mean, how can you not have energetic fun at a place like this, Darlington Raceway? I mean, all the folks that I've, I've had the opportunity to work with, Carrie Tharp and I, we do a racing show together. Chip Weil was here, Andrew Gerdes was here. Uh, we've had so many people, Jim Hunter. I mean, what a great historian, learned so, mu so much from him. Russell Branham, 
Now there's a guy with energy, and there's a guy that he and I fed off of each other in two different elements. You know, him on the racing side and then me on the radio side, we just kind of put them together and said, let's go have fun and let's, let's make this fun for all of our fans who come here to experience, you know, the track too tough to tame. I mean, this is NASCAR's oldest super speedway. This is probably one of the most family fun events you'll ever do in your life. And it's right here for all of our folks in the immediate Eastern Carolina region. It's in your backyard. So this is a great way to come experience one of the most fun things you'll ever do. And of course, you'll have some racing going on. It's going to be exciting. It always tends to be that this race, uh, given the fact it's the Cookout Southern 500, 500 miles, it wears these guys out. And I guarantee you by the time that race is getting towards the end, these drivers are frustrated, they're tired, the tires are worn out, the car is worn down, and you never know what's gonna happen. I mean, we've seen some, I mean, some odd winners here. We've seen some of those who just kind of, some way have mastered to be able to win this place. But as a fan, if you're casual, this is where you start. This is where the casual fans should start, is at Darlington Raceway, because the experience will be like anything you've never felt before. Dan says one of his proudest accomplishments was getting to bring his daughter to work with him at Darlington Raceway as she grew up. She actually now works for NASCAR as a track marketing manager. As for Dan, next season will mark his 30th year calling the Southern 500 at Darlington. Suddenly you're alone with yourself, your car, and the Darlington Raceway. Look at that fella drive. I've never seen the like of it. While it's here in Darlington, drivers hope to raise that winner's trophy in Victory Lane. But 14 miles south in Florence is where the Johnny Mans Trophy is built by a locally owned business with as much history as the track itself. The relationship with Darlington started maybe about 30 years ago. My father-in-law started the business and when I came on board, he had established a relationship with Darlington. Kenny Bryan and his wife Linda now carry on the family business her father started in 1967. Over the years, the look of the Southern 500 trophy would take many different shapes and forms. This was 1998 and this was one of the first ones that, that uh, we were commissioned to do. This goes to the 50th anniversary of Darlington Raceway. Mm -hmm. Jeff Burton, everyone knows him, he's on right. NBC now. Oh, yeah. The inception of the big trophy, this was 2009 was the first time we used it. Mark Martin was the first winner. And from there we've evolved to another tier on the big base. It's now considered one of the top trophies by NASCAR's greatest drivers, each hoping to capture that win and see their face etched into history. The versatility of the laser is we can do metal, plastic, glass, acrylic, wood. So it's just been a uh, great improvement to our industry. We stopped by the trophy shop a few days before the race as Kenny put the final touches on this year's trophy, which included adding another year below Eric Jones's picture, making him a two-time Southern 500 winner. That's his photo. Then we've cut out a frame with the laser. It has adhesive and we just frame him. And so, once everything was perfectly placed, it was time to move the trophy back into the showroom, which we found out was a two-man job for anyone planning to hoist this trophy in Victory Lane. Definitely a, a lift with the knees, not your back trophy. <laughs> no pressure. As far as this trophy goes, you guys have really put a lot of history into it, meaning that you guys start with the first winner, wraps around, and it tells the story of Darlington. It does. Uh, Darlington loves to celebrate history and this trophy definitely does that. It's the Johnny Mance Southern 500 trophy and Johnny Mance was the first winner in 1950. So he's the first photograph you see on there and each year 
every winner is recognized with their photo. It just shows you the history uh, just comes to life on this trophy. What is it about trophies that get, it just people get excited about receiving that trophy all these years later, 75 years of NASCAR, right. whether it was the first Southern or whether it's the 73rd. And I mean, people still, they love this trophy. They do. It's, uh, you know, it's not all about the money. And you hear a lot of sports figures say, hey, I want the trophy. And that's what, you know, I feel like the ones at Darlington, they want the trophy. What's so special about this trophy is how it is perceived throughout NASCAR. If you can go online and look and they've ranked the trophies in NASCAR and Darlington is number four. So the Martinsville clock is number one and the Dover Monster Mile trophy is two or three and we're number four. So we're very proud of that. And uh, also that um, it's in demand. It's just the history behind it all that makes it so special. Yeah, You got people on here like Richard Petty. We see David Pearson, Kale Yarbrough. And even though they didn't win this physical trophy, right. what's their reception when they see it and they see the history on it? They definitely seek out their photograph. So you'll see Richard Petty in Victory Lane and he'll go and find his photo. And uh, really one unusual uh, aspect about Richard Petty's photo is we have a photo on him on here without sunglasses. So that in itself is pretty cool. You don't see many pictures of Richard without sunglasses on. But um, just the, the genesis of this trophy, I was telling you earlier, the base is made in Virginia, the cup is made in North Carolina, the logo is made here in Florence, M&M &M printing. So it's a puzzle that we put together and come up with this finished product. So uh, just, just special to us and special to the area. And this is actually one that we keep here at the shop. So if anyone wants to come by, uh, feel free to come by and have a photo made with it. I think we got one guy that wants to take a photo yeah, with it right now. Hey, hey, look who's up. joining the party. Well, I'll tell you what, it's great to be here. This is wow. A, wow. What a surprise. That, i tell you what, that is, that is one fantastic trophy, that Johnny Mance trophy. Uh, we're going to be handing that out here in just a couple weeks. And uh, that thing right there is as good as it gets. Good to see good you, Good to my see man. you. Appreciate you coming the, over. This, the handiwork in this trophy and the history, the history, you look at all the winners here, and it's, it's amazing that these drivers want to win this very, very badly. And to get their picture up here on this trophy is a big deal to them. I mean, absolutely big deal. This will be the last time president of Darlington Raceway, Kerry Tharp, stops by the shop to pick up the Southern 500 trophy. He says it's the relationships like this one he's been able to build with people like Kenny and Linda that make the race so special in this small town community of Darlington. You could go to a big name trophy manufacturer in a big time factory, but you guys stay local. Well, it, it, it's more than a partnership. It's a friendship. It's a relationship. It's family. Uh, and, 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 and Kenny and Linda and everybody that works here is part of that Darlington family. And, you know, when, when you think about Darlington again, uh, you know, it, it's a, there's a family uh, tightness amongst it, right? And, uh, you know, we're, we're located in a, in a small community in Darlington. Obviously, we're part of the PD region. Uh, and, 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 but, but to be able to uh, include uh, the businesses and the partnerships from those around uh, is, is priority for us. And Darlington has a history of that and is continuing to do it. And for the Raceway to support us for 30 years, it is just means the world to us. I know you announced your retirement earlier this year. I have to ask, do you already have one of these trophies in your man cave? Are you going to have to place an order? I, no, I like to get a miniature. My, my man cave might not be able to hold something that big <laughs> or that nice, but, but uh, I can tell you that, uh, uh, that, that this trophy, we have one there in the, in the ticket office, and, and we get a lot of 
people that come in, particularly during race time, a lot of people that come in and, and want to take a look at that trophy and get their picture with that trophy. All right, yeah. speaking like of miniatures, <laughs> yeah. speaking of this, this can be carries, but yeah. he's going to want his picture at the top. No, not, so. not at all. No, so. <laughs> right, right here you got uh, Kevin Harvick. Uh, this is the September 6, 220. Th this is the trophy that he's talking about that, you know, the, the, the race teams, I think, individual trophies. Right. It's not all about the money these days. Mm -mm. They want the trophy. They do. I mean, some drivers will tell you that the trophy means as much as anything. And... You know, you go to the different race shops, and we visit all of them uh, during the course of the season. And when you see this Johnny Mance trophy on display, Stands whether it be up. at Joe Gibbs Racing, Hendrick, Penske, uh, Childress, wherever you see this on display, it, it, it makes, it, it, I tell you what, I take a lot of pride in it. I know you yeah, will take a lot of pride yeah, in it absolutely. because you know that that this one here is a crown jewel. This is a crown jewel event. This uh, this Southern 500, and and uh, you know it's a it's a trophy that uh, has a lot of memories. And man, you just look at these names of these drivers on here: Gordon, Jarrett, Burton, Mark Martin, Lorenz, and Petty, Pearson, Yarborough. I mean, I could go on and Junior on. Johnson. Jimmy Johnson, Junior Johnson, Jimmy Johnson. It's a who's who of NASCAR. And when you're able to, you know, portray the history on a trophy like this, I, I just think it makes it even more special. Two-time Southern 500 winner Eric Jones says it's pretty cool getting to see his face on the trophy alongside so many legends in the sport. Kenny says it's also exciting for him getting to see the trophy that he built get hoisted by the winning driver every year in victory lane. Well, this season doesn't just mark the 75th anniversary for NASCAR. It's also the end of an era at Darlington Raceway. As track president Kerry Tharp announced earlier this year, he would be retiring after the 73rd annual Southern 500. Tharp has been serving as president of the track since 2016 and took some time to look back on his legendary career. Kerry, we are leading up to what will be your official last Southern 500 as racetrack president here at Darlington. Uh, what's kind of been the emotion as you've been doing the media tour and getting ready for, for this final race? Well, I'm excited. I, I can tell you that. And I'm really enjoying uh, uh, this, this lead up uh, to the 74th run of the Cookout Southern 500. And something that I enjoy is talking about Darlington Raceway and, and getting our fans excited. And so that's really been my focus and the things that I've wanted to do is just make sure that our fans are fired up for this event. And, and that instills in me a, a, you know, a, a passion and desire to, to make this race the, the best one yet. When you got here to Darlington for the first time, what was kind of going through your mind? It, it's a small town in South Carolina, not a lot this way, not a lot that way. When you first got here, what, what was your thoughts? Well, certainly I, I was already living in the state of South Carolina. I've been here since 1985, lived in Columbia and then Fort Mill and then came down here to Darlington and the PD, but you know, I just love the state of South Carolina. I really don't care where, where, where I'm living as far as that goes, but you know, the community here at Darlington uh, really, really embraced me. I think I was the first track president to live in Darlington since the 90s. And so I think that uh, was something that, that people uh, appreciated. And I just became part of the community. You know, I shop here, I worship here, I socialize here. I, you know, uh, go to the grocery store here, and it's amazing how many people you see on a daily basis uh, that are your neighbors. And uh, so I, I just felt a, a really quick uh, kinship with the folks here in Darlington, and, and that's meant a lot to me and my wife. And you've meant a lot to this community. I know a lot of people were sad to hear that you're retiring, but also very happy for you because you've done so much for the racetrack here. When you got here, did you have goals of what you wanted Darlington to become? I, I just jumped in head first uh, and, and really, you know, uh, I, I just wanted to continue the, the tradition that this track had had, had, had in the past. Uh, the throwback weekend was entering year two. Obviously, I wanted to build upon that. Uh, we still only had the one race date, and so I really, really wanted to try to to help get back that second race date. And uh, we were able to accomplish that. And, 
And uh, that's meant a lot, I think, to not only this, this racetrack and this community, but to the sport of NASCAR. And so, you know, I didn't really list, sit down and write four or five things that I wanted to do. One thing that I wanted to do was just make sure that, you know, this racetrack stood out, uh, continued to, to shine as a crown jewel in our sport and uh, make sure that the people that come to our track enjoy themselves and want to come back on a, on a year after year basis. What does it mean to you that this track means so much to the drivers of NASCAR? We've talked a lot about the history of tracks. This track has a unique brand. Uh, not every track has a brand, but we have a brand. Too Tough to Tame, Lady in Black. It's the most difficult track that the drivers try to test uh, during the course of the season. And, you know, if you win at Darlington, uh, I mean, you've accomplished a lot. And uh, I like to tell people that I think Darlington is like the Wrigley Field of NASCAR. It's got that mystique, it's got that history, that tradition. Uh, and, you know, we might not be the fanciest place, uh, but I think we're on the, on the cool chart, we're right at the top. And so to be able to continue that tradition that started here back in 1950, continue to build on that tradition, uh, is exciting and the fans love coming here. The drivers certainly love coming here and winning here. It's a big deal. You know, everybody wants to win the Daytona 500. That's our Super Bowl. But I can tell you this right, right there in that next little area is a, is the cookout Southern 500. So it's a, it's a big event and a big part of the NASCAR schedule. You call it the track too tough to tame. Are you surprised that after almost 75 years, no driver has really been able to figure out what is the secret line, what is the secret path at Darlington? Well, it, it's really not that surprising. If you take some laps around here just in your street car, you, you, got, you get a little bit of an appreciation of what these, uh, these men and women do when they drive around here. It's not a very wide track, okay? And all the, all the turns and corners are different. The banking's different. And uh, it just makes for a very, very difficult challenge. And, you know, Dale Earnhardt called it a finicky track, okay? He won here, I guess, uh, eight times maybe, I think. So uh, I think he thought that this was probably his most challenging track too. And, you know, the greats have won here, the Pearsons, the Yarboroughs, the Earnhardts, the Gordons, and, you know, I could go on and on. But it, this is a track uh, that has always posed a very difficult test for the drivers, and I think it will continue to do that. As you enter this next chapter of your life, South Carolina you said your second home away from home. Uh, Darlington has become a place that you've known to grow and love. Um, where will Darlington uh, be in your heart? And uh, is it a place that you want to still have a connection with even as you head into this next chapter? Well, Darlington will always be in my heart. Uh, you know, it, you, you spend enough time here and, and it's something that, that becomes part of your heart and soul. And, and I think I've poured my heart and soul uh, into Darlington and, and my family. Uh, uh, certainly has, has loved this place. We will continue to love and support this, this track and everything that it does. And, and you know, it's got a great future ahead of it. And so we're, go we're gonna support that. And uh, again, I just love living in this community. I love living in the state of South Carolina. I just think that the people in this state uh, make it what it is. And uh, certainly Darlington Raceway is a big part of this state. And without the community support, um, I don't think Darlington would be as successful as it is, whether it's, like you said, the trophy being made in Florence. You have local painters that are from Darlington. What is it about the community that has embraced this racetrack? And what Harold was saying was probably the reason it's still alive it's almost 75 years later. Well, it's a hometown racetrack. And, you know, so many of the, of the elements that are part of this track, uh, you know, as you mentioned, whether it be the, the company that, that produces the trophies or that paints the walls or the, or the track itself or puts up the fencing uh, or cleans the, the, the facility, they're all local here for the most part. And so uh, I think that gives them a sense of pride in knowing that they help keep this place uh, uh, up and alive and running. And, and uh, when, you, when you have people invested like that, particularly those that are in this community and they see the fruits of their labor, it means a lot to them to be able to say, hey, I helped that racetrack and they put on a great race and I played a little small role in that. And so that's been going on here for a long, long time. And I think it's very, very important to continue that. During your time here at Darlington, is there any a memory, a moment that sticks in your mind that, that when someone asks you, what is it about Darlington that you love, that that's gonna be the first memory you remember? 
Well, I can tell you this. I think that during the pandemic, uh, we were fortunate enough to bring back, bring back live sports to this country. Not just live racing, but live sports in May of 2020. And so for us to be able to do that, I thought was something that I'll never forget. Uh, very memorable, impactful. I think it helped us secure our second race date shortly thereafter. And then when we were able to get the fans to come back, start coming back, uh, it was, it was, you know, they had missed it. You know, our fans had, had, had been away for a couple of races and so they missed it. And, you know, the support we get here is outstanding. I can remember in 2019, we had a long lengthy rain delay, five or six hour rain delay. And yet when we took the green flag about 10 o'clock, the stands were practically full. And so we just have that type of support uh, here at Darlington, and, and, and but looking back on, the, on that event in May of 2020, that's one that sticks out. You were talking about that rain delay. I remember it vividly, race ending almost at 2, 3 in the morning. Right. And I think that's where I realized NASCAR has a very special relationship with the fans. You talk about the fan interaction, whether it's camping in the infield, whether it's filling these grandstands. When COVID happened, I think drivers took a new appreciation for the fans. When you came out here and saw the fans for the first time after coming back from the pandemic, did it have a different feel than maybe coming to a race in the past? It had a much different feel. When we were able to get fans back in the grandstands and, and uh, be able to see them excited about being able to be back to a live sporting event at Darlington, uh, that meant the world to us. And that even gave us a greater appreciation of, of the support that we get and the sacrifices that they make. Uh, to come out to our races uh, during the course of the season. And so, uh, you know, our fans are what makes us here, right? And so, uh, you know, we put on great racing. I think we put on a great event, and I think our fans are very, very special. You got a lot of love and support from people when you made the announcement of your retirement. I'm sure this upcoming race weekend, you're going to get a lot more of that. Have you thought about what that final moment will be once the checkered flag is waved and whoever wins crosses the finish line? what that moment will be like walking back out here for the final time? Oh, I think it'll be exciting. Uh, I, I, get, I get really, really excited uh, towards the end of a race, and uh, I, I don't think that's gonna change. Uh, now, maybe a few days afterwards, I'll look back and, and kind of reminisce, but I think in that moment, uh, I'm just going to soak it up. Uh, I'm gonna enjoy it just like the fans are enjoying it. And uh, I can't wait to give that trophy to the, to the next winner of the Cookout Southern 500. And, uh, you know, I look forward to that very, very much. You'll be able to catch Kerry in victory lane this Sunday night, handing over the trophy to this year's winner of the Southern 500. And we wish him nothing but the best in his retirement. Well, thanks again for joining us here for our special on Darlington Raceway and the Southern 500. If you missed any episodes of the final stretch, you can catch up right now on WMBFnews.com or our streaming apps and, of course, our YouTube channel as well. Now it's time to sit back, enjoy the race, and we'll see you guys all at the track Too Tough to Tame. Suddenly you're alone with yourself, your car, and the Darlington Raceway. Look at that fella drive. I've never seen the like of it.